It's Friday, March 4th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and today we have the preliminary report from the NTSB regarding the fatal accident of the PC-12 aircraft November 7-9 November X-ray that occurred on 13 February near Beaufort, North Carolina. Though we know that the pilot lost control of this aircraft, we still don't know why the pilot lost control of this aircraft, but this report does help clear up some of the speculation that's going on out there regarding this accident. So we'll go through this report, review what they're telling us in this report, and then um, go over some pertinent PC-12 systems that may or may not be pertinent to this accident. This aircraft started out on a VFR flight from Hyde County Airport and endeavored to pick up an IFR pickup to land at Michael J. Smith Airfield, and in the process, stumbled into restricted area 5306, got turned around, and then headed down the VFR corridor along the coast, avoiding this restricted area and the warning area W122. Here's the actual flight path according to FlightAware. Here's where they did the 180 out of the restricted area. We'll talk about that in, in the report. Then came down the VFR corridor, and everything appeared to be going just fine until the last two minutes of the flight where the aircraft pitched up and climbed from 1,700 feet to 4,300 feet, losing airspeed, and eventually uh, it's assumed that the aircraft stalled and spun from this altitude into the ocean. And in this accident report, we'll see that this aircraft was attempting to navigate to Saigor, IAF for the RNAV runway 26 approach here at Michael J. Smith Field on an IFR clearance. And here's a picture of the accident aircraft, November 7-9, November X-ray, a PC-12NG. On February 13th of 2022 at 1402 Eastern Standard Time, the Plattis PC-12, November 7-9, November X-ray was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Beaufort, North Carolina, the commercial pilot, student pilot, and six passengers were fatally injured. The airplane was operating as a Title 14 Part 91, FAR Part 91, General Aviation Personal Flight. The aircraft departed Pitt Greenville Airport, Greenville, North Carolina, about 1235 earlier in the day, and then landed at Hyde County Airport, 7 Whiskey 6, Englehart, North Carolina, at 1255. Then the airplane departed runway 29, at about 13.35. This was um, after what was presumed to be a hunting trip with, with everybody on board, family members on board. After departure, the pilot contacted air traffic control, reported they were going to level off at 3,500 feet MSL and requested VFR visual flight rules following, VFR flight following, as well as an IFR clearance into Michael J. Smith Airport, MRH, Beaufort, North Carolina. So this is not uncommon where you take off VFR. Remember, there's showers in the area that they're trying to avoid to remain VFR and then get your IFR clearance as you fly towards your destination. At 1338, this is only about three minutes after departure, the controller advised the pilot that nearby restricted airspace was active and the pilot confirmed that they would remain clear of the airspace and fly to the east. At 1341, the controller called the pilot and indicated that they were about to enter the restricted airspace. After multiple calls with no response from the pilot, the controller instructed the military aircraft in the restricted airspace to remain at or above 4,000 feet. So he, <laughs> he got the military guys out of this pilot's way as he stumbled into an active restricted area. At 1349, the pilot called the controller to request the RNAV approach to runway 26 at their destination airport, but was denied the request because the active because the restricted airspace was active. Furthermore, the controller queried the pilot as to why didn't you respond to the earlier radio calls, and the pilot responded that he was trying to get out and was unable to receive the radio transmissions. I don't know if he was trying to get a radio call out or trying to get out of the restricted airspace. This may be a problem where he's already having problems navigating, trying to remain VFR in, in um, the cloudy conditions that day. 
and perhaps too low to receive the radio transmissions. The controller then offered an approach to runway 8 or runway 3, and the pilot chose runway 8. So here's where the pilot stumbles into the restricted area and then works his way out and, and then down the coast. And here's the restricted area that he stumbled into, and here's the free airspace, if you will, outside of the warning area and the restricted airspace running down the coast. At 1352, the controller reported that the restricted airspace was no longer active and asked if the pilot would want the RNAV approach to runway 26 instead, which was what the pilot initially requested. The pilot responded that he would appreciate that, and the controller cleared the pilot direct to Saigor, the initial approach fix for the RNAV 26 approach. Here's Saigor, the initial approach fix for the runway 26 approach, which will line you up nicely as you come down the coast. At 1355, the controller called the airplane and asked to verify if they were going direct to Saigor because the airplane was still on a southwesterly heading. The pilot responded, Roger, and the controller said that the airplane could proceed direct to Saigor to cross the waypoint at or above 1,900 feet MSL and was cleared for the runway 26 RNAV approach. The pilot read back the instructions correctly, and then at 1358, the controller contacted the airplane and issued a heading to Saigor, but then indicated the airplane was, was correcting now. At 13.58, the controller called the pilot and issued the local altimeter setting because the airplane was at 1,700 feet MSL and it was supposed to maintain 1,900 feet MSL. The pilot read back the altimeter setting correctly, but that was the last transmission from the airplane. Here we see the 1,900 foot altitude, minimum altitude, for... Um, starting this approach at Saigor. Here on the data, we see that the aircraft was at 1,700 feet when he should have been at 1,900 feet. So lots of small steps of confusion leading up to this incident. At 1401, the controller called the airplane and asked what altitude it was at because the airplane was now at 4,700 feet and climbing quickly. There was no response. Radar contact was lost with the airplane at 1402, and an all knot was issued at 1429. Throughout the communication with air traffic control, there were no distress calls or a declaration of an emergency from the airplane. The airplane impacted the Atlantic Ocean and was located by the U.S. Coast Guard three miles offshore in about 60 feet of water. So they found the aircraft right there. Dive crews recovered an ELT and a light data recorder, LDR, and the LDR is at the NTSB Recorders Laboratory, and they're da they've downloaded the data and are investigating it now. So hopefully that data will explain the last moments of this flight. According to the FAA Airman's Record, the pilot held a commercial pilot certificate with ratings in airplane multi-engine land, airplane single-engine land, and instrument airplane. In addition, he held a ground instructor certificate and held a mechanic certificate for airframe and power plant. His most recent second-class medical was issued on June 28th. At that time, he reported 3,000 hours of flight experience. According to FAA Airman Records, the passenger seated in the right seat held a student pilot certificate. I believe this was his son, the student pilot. And he, and they, it has been determined that the son was in the right seat. And his most recent third-class medical certificate was on 6 June of 21, and he had only 20 hours of flight experience. They still have yet to recover the aircraft, it sounds like. So they found the aircraft, but they have yet to recover the entire aircraft. Conditions at the accident site, IMC. 900 foot ceiling. Temperature dew point spread, only one degree, seven degrees Celsius on the temperature, six degrees on the dew point. That's anytime you're less than two degrees, that means fog. 
Winds 13 knots, gust to 18, 10 miles visibility below the overcast. Eight fatalities. Because of the temperature at seven degrees at the accident site, they're in icing conditions but not severe icing conditions that the PC-12 cannot handle. But one thing the investigators will be exploring is what about the loss of reliable airspeed indications as a result of problems with the pedostatic system. The pedo system on the PC-12 are two pedo probes mounted on each wing because it's the single engine turboprop. So, and it has two AOA vanes attached to these heated pedo tubes. Again, one on each wing. And this works in conjunction with the stall warning system, which we'll talk about in a moment. Those pitot tubes and the static ports are heated via the de-icing probe switches that are located in the cockpit. And that's part of your before taxi, yeah, before taxi checklist. Item uh, seven here de-icing probe switch on and you check to make sure that the caution lights are off. So if the pilot had for neglected to push these switches as part of his before taxi checklist, he would have had warning lights on during the entire flight. What about runaway pitch trim? That could cause a, a large pitch up in the aircraft, it's something practiced in the simulator frequently. And the procedure is to hit the trim interrupt switch to interrupt in the PC-12. In other words, disable the electric trim system from running away. And depending on the PC-12, depending on the advisory lights that you get, start pulling circuit breakers. And that trim interrupt switch is located right here, just above the power and condition levers. And of course, anytime you have any problem with this automation, you want to disconnect the autopilot, which is located right there next to the uh, trim switch on the yoke, each yoke. Now, once you get the PC-12 up to a point where you're about to stall the aircraft, there are three systems on board the PC-12 that were required for its certification to assist you and prevent you from stalling the aircraft because the PC-12 does have a rather notorious stall characteristic if you allow it to develop all the way into a stall. So you've got the stall warning, you've got a stick shaker, which is going to warn you before the stall, and you have a stick pusher system, which is going to push the nose down and prevent you from getting into the stall in the first place. Here's the factory flight testing of the PC-12 without using the stall system. It's got a nasty stall which will break to the right and roll and can potentially roll all the way over on its back now these stalls are shown in the configured landing configuration but if you allow the pc-12 to get into a fully developed stall you're going to lose a lot of altitude very quickly so in order to get certified the pc-12 had to have installed these stick shaker and pusher systems and here's a great article from one of the original aerodynamicists on the PC-12 explaining how they developed the stick shaker and pusher system to comply with the FARs for the certification of the PC-12. Now with the stick pusher and stick shaker system engaged and working, it turns this into a non-event. Boom, recovered Using the two angle of attack indicators and the two computers, the system will nudge the nose right over before the aircraft actually stalls. So there's the shaker. And there's the stick pusher. Very quick recovery. Shaker and pusher and recovered. However, this stick shaker system can be overridden on the control yoke. The stick pusher interrupt switch is located right here on the control yoke next to the push to talk switch for the radio. And that allows you to interrupt the stick pusher system in the event that you're getting a stick pusher when you, in fact, do not want it or need it. And these systems are all tested 
before every departure. At least that's what it says in the checklists. So the stall warning and stick pusher system is actuated by the two angle of attack indicators, two independent AOA veins, not the indicators, but the veins located on the uh, pitot tubes that we looked at earlier. The stick shaker pusher system consists of two AOA sensors, two computers, and a single stick shaker and a single stick pusher. The two computers are connected in such a way that either computer can independently provide a stall warning and or stick shaker, but both computers must agree before they actuate the stick pusher. The stick pusher is inhibited uh, inhibited automatically for five seconds after takeoff. The shaker and aural stall warning are operative immediately after liftoff. The stick pusher actuator has a built-in G-switch which inhibits the stick pusher when the airplane's normal acceleration becomes less than 0.5 Gs. Remember, you cannot stall an airplane at 0 Gs. The output torque of the stick pusher actuator is electronically limited to have a force of 60 to 65 foot-pounds on the control wheel. A slip clutch on the stick pusher capstan allows control of the elevator with a force of 85 to 90 pounds on the control wheel. So you can overcome the stick pusher with quite a bit of force, 80 to 90 pounds. This allows the pilot or co-pilot to override the stick pusher in the instance of an inadvertent operation. Each outboard control wheel horn is equipped with a pusher interrupt push switch, providing a means to quickly disable the stick pusher actuator as long as the switch is pressed in the event of an inadvertent operation. The pilot's pusher interrupt switch, this is on the left yoke, stops the motor of the servo actuator and also disengages the clutch of the servo actuator. This provides for free column movement of the elevators from the cockpit. It's as if the stick pusher is no longer pushing. But there's a difference on the co-pilot's yoke. The co-pilot's pusher interrupt switch only stops the motor of the servo actuator and to move the elevators enough force must be applied to the control column to back drive the servo or to slip the capstan clutch assembly. So that's going to require that 85 to 90 pounds of force from the co-pilot side, even with the stick pusher interrupt switch depressed. Then there's a slight difference in the stick pusher condition when in icing conditions. It apparently pushes, gets you the stick pusher even quicker in icing conditions. And then the associated warning with this system, stalls must be avoided when the stick pusher is inoperative. Excessive wind drop, wing drop and altitude loss may result during stall with flaps down and or when power is applied. And I think for most part 135 operators, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, is this a no-go item for you guys operating part 135? If the stick pusher system is in up, you're not flying? So from this accident, investigators will be looking possibly at this stick pusher system. Is it possible that in a panic situation that you inadvertently hit the pusher interrupt switches? Would the person, the student pilot in the right seat inadvertently hit the pusher interrupt switches? Does that cause both yokes to remain heavy and disable the stick pusher system at a time when you might actually want it to work? Hopefully, the data from the light data recorder on board this aircraft can help explain this mystery as to why these pilots lost control of this aircraft in these light icing conditions. Thanks so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.